morning. Welcome to Grace Heritage Church. I think that's loud enough for you to hear, isn't it? Let's, let's find a place and uh, prepare to uh, worship the Lord together. Let me encourage you, if you uh, did not on your way in pick up one of these bulletins, you need, you're going to need that. It has the words for the songs and all those kinds of things. Um, and let me say uh, thanks to John Lanier for preaching for me last week. Um, and thank you for praying for my mom as she had uh, surgery and is doing much better. If you're into pictures of, of feet after surgery, I've got pictures I can show you. So you can, you can go, you can, you can increase your sympathy level for my, my dear little mother. Um, let's see, and let me say uh, that today we have one more Sunday when we're going to hear reports from people who have been out on mission through the summer. Um, we've already heard from several folks, folks who have been to Guatemala, to Mexico, uh, to uh, the, the roughness of the beach, and uh, so forth and so on. And, and today we'll get to hear from uh, uh, two more folks, one of those being uh, Caleb Petrie. And we're glad to have Caleb back home. It's good to see your face again. Still smiling like normal, so we're, we're thankful for that. And also Henry Yu will tell us about some things he learned in his summer experience. So those are some things that are coming during our Bible study time. And let me say welcome to those of you who are here as guests. I'm looking around seeing several new faces or faces who have returned from uh, your summer away. We're glad to have you guys home. There are some cards in the little seat back pockets that I hope are close to you. And we encourage you to grab one of those little cards and fill it out and place it in the offering plate a little bit later this morning. When, when it's passed, we're not trying to give you a guilt trip about giving. We want to give you the opportunity to let us know that you're here and to let us know how we might be able to minister to you or encourage you. And the Lord being our helper, we will uh, pray for you and try to uh, encourage you in any way that we can. Okay? So those are some reminders and encouragements for you as we begin this morning. Um, we also have established a room just down the hallway, the first door on the left, that is uh, our satellite broadcast location. And uh, so if, if you have children that you're training to be in worship with you and they get to a place where they're noisy and just need a place to wiggle and be a little less distracting, that's available to you. So we want you to know about that and encourage you to, to avail yourself of that opportunity. Let's turn our hearts to worship the Lord together. Oh, and I'm forgetting one last thing I need to say. I'm supposed to verbally remind you week to week. Next week we'll be meeting together in a members meeting and we'll be voting on a provision to interview and receive new members since Pastor Stan Reeves is going to take a sabbatical uh, through the first semester of, of this year school year sort of, uh, we, we'll, I'll need help in doing that. So we'll have a members meeting next week and we expect all of our members to come to the meetings and so that'll come after lunch and then immediately after our members meeting we're going to go to the home of uh, the Gues where there is water so that we can baptize. So we're thankful for that opportunity as well. So we'll be looking forward to baptizing, just having a good day of spending being together next week, all right? Now turn your attention to the front of the worship bulletin if you would please. We begin our time of worship together week after week by reading scripture and letting that call us to worship the Lord. And so when you found that, I'd invite you to stand together with me and we'll read from Psalm 113 together. Would you join me as we read together? Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and His glory above the heavens. Would you join me as we pray together before we sing this morning? Father, You have gathered us this morning literally from all around the state and surrounding areas. You have drawn your people together to worship you this morning. And we bow before you to thank you for the joy and privilege of being together. And we pray that you will help us to praise the Lord, to exalt you, to honor you, to bow before you as our king, to have our hearts and our thinking transformed 
by what you have said in your word and to submit to what you have called us to do and to be by the power of Jesus Christ, our crucified and resurrected and returning King. Oh, Father, I thank you for lots of different faces and, and folks who have come to join us this morning. Uh, some are students, I suppose, who have, have come to school and are ready to begin the semester. And others, maybe just families or individuals in our area, seeking a place where they can worship together. But, oh, God, you have planted in our heart this morning a desire and an understanding of, of the, the importance and worth and value of gathering with your people on the Lord's Day to worship. And so I pray that you would bless and help and strengthen and encourage us by our time together this morning. Encourage and strengthen us by your word. Bless us as we sing these songs together and as we hear one another singing. May we be encouraged. Strengthen us by your word through your spirit. We ask for all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time sing your song again whatever may pass and whatever lies before me let me be singing when the evening comes bless the Lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his holy like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will my heart to find. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. And all that strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come, still my soul will sing your praise unending, ten thousand years and then forevermore, bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. His holy name Sing like never before Oh my soul I worship your holy name I worship your holy name I worship your holy name Oh! 
there in your worship bulletin a reminder of the gospel from Titus chapter 3 verses 4 to 7. And the scripture declares that when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The hymn that we just sang declares the holiness of God and the otherness of God. The fact that we can't approach God because He is so different from us and because we are so different from Him. But the hymn that we sang also declares the mercy of God. It talks about the three persons of God and that God the Father ordained and, and purposed to redeem sinners from their sins, to rescue sinners, and that Jesus died to secure that rescue and that the Holy Spirit came to apply that rescue to us. And so the, the full picture of the gospel is all through these hymns we've been singing just as the scripture declares it to be true. And so we're reminded of the good provision of God for us and of our desperate need for that provision. So would you bow for a moment with me in, in silent prayer of repentance and faith, repenting of the sin that separates you from a holy God and faith believing that God indeed does through his provision in Christ rescue you from those sins. Sovereign God, you are, are holy, holy, holy. You are completely other than we are. You are separated from us by your holiness and we are separated from you by our sins. We believe that Jesus Christ died to rescue us from our sins and we believe that God the Holy Spirit applies this provision to us so that we might be the very righteousness of God so that we might come before you this day with confidence and that we might come to you to find the help that we so desperately need. And so we thank you and give you praise and glory and honor for this good provision, faithful and complete and satisfying provision that is ours because of Jesus Christ. And we thank you in his name. Amen. Would you stand and sing a hymn of assurance with me as we rejoice in the Redeemer? I will glory in my Redeemer, 
Whose priceless blood has ransomed me. Mine was the sin that drove the bitter nails and hung him on that judgment tree. I will glory in my Redeemer who crushed the power of sin and death. My only Savior before the Holy Judge, the Lamb who is my righteousness, the Lamb who is my righteousness. I will glory in my Redeemer, my life he bought. Our scripture reading this morning is Psalm chapter 22. Pastor Paul asked that we substitute this passage for the one in your bulletin this morning. And believing that only scripture is infallible, that's what we've decided to do. So our, our passage this morning is commonly referred to as a messianic psalm, meaning that it contains references to the future life at that time, the future life of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. In this case, it contains several references to events surrounding the crucifixion, which will be the subject of Pastor Paul's sermon this morning uh, in the book of John. Uh, we should be careful not to mis make the mistake, however, of believing that every detail of this psalm applies directly to the life of Christ. As with most prophetic scripture, the message of this psalm has both uh, or had both a present meaning at that time and also was looking forward to future events. And this psalm is no exception. May God give us wisdom as we read. And I hope that you'll especially pay attention to the end of this psalm, which is just absolutely glorious. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? From the words of my groaning, O oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you was I cast from my birth. And from my mother's womb, you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near and there is none to help. 
Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death, for dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, for my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. Amen? Amen. Isn't that awesome? Man, if you can't see, it is finished right at the end of that. Huh? That just occurred to me right before I came up. I, I mean, obviously, I'm... <laughs> Uh, all right. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a glory it is to read your word and to see the unity of Scripture and how these things um, spoken many hundreds of years before the coming of Christ uh, were realized and made um, uh, plain to man, and your prophecies were um, fulfilled in the life of Christ, and we glory in that this morning. And Father, as we see many events here um, forecast surrounding the crucifixion, uh, I pray that you would prepare our hearts, even with the seeds of Psalm 22 this morning, as we uh, hear the preaching of the book of John later here in just a few moments. Might we see um, the power and the import of these events uh, in the uh, redemptive history of all of humanity. And I pray especially, Lord, that this message of the importance of the crucifixion, the death of Christ, and what it means to us today might be made plain to our hearts and that we would be moved um, to worship you and to give thanks. And for some here, oh God, I just pray that they would bow before you even the first time uh, and be saved. Holy Spirit, come upon this congregation this morning, we pray. And Father, I pray for our pastor as he brings the word to us. I pray that you would strengthen and embolden him to preach powerfully and that his words would be your words and that our hearts would be prepared even as good soil to receive the good seed as it comes to our hearts. For your people, I pray that they would be edified and encouraged and comforted and moved to a full appreciation of the salvation that we have in Christ. And for those who do not know you, Lord, I pray that you would even now begin to stir their hearts to expect that something grand and big and life-changing would happen to them this morning and that it would be toward their salvation, we ask in Christ's name. Amen.
songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Hitherto thy love has blessed me, thou hast brought and turn to John chapter 19 with me, please. Our journey through the Gospel of John is almost over. Come today, as Kevin shared with you already, to this picture of the crucifixion. And one is tempted to read across this text say, that, that, that's a familiar story. In fact, I'm wondering, um, out of curiosity, and I'm not, my, this is not an attempt to embarrass anyone who may have never heard the story of the crucifixion. If, if you haven't, that's, that's not your fault. But how many of you here have heard the story of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ before? Read it in the Bible, heard it, talked about, okay. So, our tendency can be to come to something like this and go, yeah, read that, seen that, been there, done that, and say, what's next? What's the, the next thing for me to, to be able to know about being a Christian? And I would like to encourage you this morning to understand that it is the cross work of Christ that is at the center of your entire Christian experience. The cross work of Christ informs your worship it enables your obedient response and it transforms your knowledge. All of life is worship and the cross is at the center of that. We're to be obedient to Christ and the cross is at the center of our obedient response. And the scripture says that we've, we've come to know God and so all of our knowledge is to be transformed we're to have our minds renewed. And so if the cross is at the center of that, I'm, I propose to you that everything about the Christian life rotates around the cross and the cross work of Christ. Now John's writing to people here who have no category for a crucified Messiah. 
they, they cannot connect in their thinking in any way Messiah and one who has been crucified. Crucifixion carried with it the curse of God for them, not the provision of God for them. And so they don't have any idea of a Messiah who would go to the cross and die and be buried. They don't have any concept of a king who would be crucified. I can't make that point strongly enough because we don't have any problem going, yeah, Jesus was crucified, died on the cross for our sins. That just, boom, it just pops out. It's almost as natural as breathing to those of us who have heard the story and believed it. We think that. My question for us today is how the cross, believing that, how is that making a difference in our lives? John is calling on them to believe that this is true so that they can worship him as their king, so that they can submit to him in obedience, and so they, they can know that God has come to make provision for their sins. How are we responding to that? What does our belief in the cross work of Christ produce in our lives? And so those three things that I've mentioned a couple of times are going to be the point of of this text for us today, and then there are some questions within the context of each of those, those things that, that the cross work of Christ informs our worship, it shapes or empowers our uh, obedient response, and, and it transforms our knowledge. So let's begin reading, if we could, in the middle of verse 16. Your Bibles may have a, a paragraph separation there and even a heading that speaks of the crucifixion. We're going to read there to verse 37. So they took Jesus, that is the Roman soldiers and the Jews who were going to, to see to his crucifixion. And he went out bearing his own cross to the place uh, called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. They, there they crucified him and with two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but rather, This man said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier and also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, 
they will look on him whom they have pierced. This is the word of God. And may he open our hearts to hear, and understand, and to believe. And believing have life in his name. Believing always produces fruit. Always generates response. Belief precedes action. And it's important for us today to remember that when you hear me use that word, believe, do you believe this? That I'm not talking about intellectual assent or acknowledgement of facts, but I'm talking about has this so gripped your life that it has changed you? Now maybe it's only changed you a little bit. I'm not talking about degree of change, but I'm talking about consequence. That there's been consequence or fruit or result uh, of your belief. And then, first of all, we want to think about how the cross work of Jesus informs our worship. And I want to clarify that word as well. When I say that the work of Christ informs our worship, many of you may have the tendency to start thinking about music. You know, lots of people today divide up what happens at church in terms of worship and preaching. Like they're two distinct things. I'm not talking about singing. Certainly singing and what we've been doing this morning is worship. But I'm talking, when I use this word, I'm talking about what rules your heart. When Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is at hand, I'm here to establish my rule and reign, then he's talking about establishing his rule and reign in your heart. So, Understand this morning that life is not made up principally of a half dozen big life-changing events. And some of you are, are doing some of that right now. You're, you're students and you're coming to, to college this fall and you're ready to settle into classes. And it was a big, huge deal to choose where you're going to go to school and, and to start and pick a career and all those kinds of things. But that's not, I'm not talking about that. And that's not nearly so significant in the long run as the hundred little choices that you make every day. As you stand and hold these two things and you ask the question, how will I worship? In other words, which of these will rule and reign in my heart? So the, the hundred little choices that you're making day by day are the things that I'm talking about when I say that the cross work of Jesus informs our worship. What kinds of things, to whom or to what do you habitually bow? That's the question I want you to consider as you're thinking about that. To what or to whom does your heart habitually bow day to day to day as you're going through your life? The Jews who read this inscription that was placed at the top of the cross disagreed with it and they had seen this happen many times before the point of the placard was to declare the crime of the person who was being crucified. And oftentimes they were made to wear it around their neck as they carried the cross piece to the place of crucifixion. And then that placard was taken from them and it was attached to the cross to proclaim what they had done to deserve such a cursed death. And the Jews want Pilate to change what the placard says so that it sounds like a crime he proclaimed or he said or he pretended to be the king of the Jews. But Pilate, for whatever reason, you know, maybe humanly speaking, because this is his last little bit of, of a poke back at the Jews who had been manipulating him to bring on the execution of what he believed was an innocent man. Maybe he takes this last poke at them and says, no, I'm going to do what I want to do. And I say he was the king of the Jews. And I don't know that he was even saying that as much as he was poking at them. But unknowingly, Pilate proclaims the truth. And he even accomplishes what's declared in Psalm chapter 96, verse 10. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. And as Pilate inscribes above the cross in three different languages, languages that most of the world would have recognized in that day, that this is the king of the Jews. He is unknowingly fulfilling the, the command or the desire of God even in this poke that he takes at the Jews. And he says, this is the king. This is the one who reigns over all things. Now, 
rationally, if you try to transport yourself in your mind's eye back to the crucifixion, and you think about what's going on, the things that Kevin read from Psalm 22, the things that I've just read from John chapter 19, and you picture that, this is a sight of tragedy. It's a sight of, of people spitting on Christ and mocking Him of what is apparently a completely naked figure who has been beaten within an inch of his life by expert Roman uh, abusers. And, and he's hanging there pitifully on the cross. And, and even the Jews gather around him and mock him and say, this is the one who said he was going to tear down the temple and rebuild it in three days. He can't even get himself down from this cross. And, and as the mockery falls on him and the, the ugliness and the, the tragedy is apparent, no one would look at him and say, there is my king, let alone that is God and I will worship him. And so the placard is placed there to remind us that even what rationally defies our thinking is true, that this one hanging on the cross is the king and that he is due your worship as the king, that he is due your bowing before him as your king and your provider. John chapter 3, verse 14, Jesus says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And in the midst of this agony and apparent defeat was consummate victory. Jesus was being lifted up publicly, and it was the means of declaring once and for all that he is the king that God sent, the king of those who would belong to him. And in John chapter 8, verse 28, Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as my Father taught me. The public humiliation was his coronation, and the throne was, or the cross was his throne. This public humiliation was his coronation as the king, and the cross was his throne. So how do we respond? Do you believe that this crucified one is the king? What is your response to him? And when your flesh desires something altogether different, when, even when your rational thinking looks at a situation and says, that cannot be what God wants or intended, how are you going to respond? Now, let me be more blunt and specific, young people. When you're standing before decisions and choices this semester about your purity and about academic integrity or about honoring your parents even though they're far away from you and you know what they want or if you're still living in the home of your parents and they know you know what they want, how are you going to weigh that out? To whom will you bow your heart as your king? Or husbands, let me ask you, when Jesus calls us to love our wives like Christ loved the church, and this picture of him dying and sacrificing everything for us comes into view. And we're saying, oh, but everything in my flesh wants to not love my wife well in this moment. I would rather be selfish. I would rather be self-providing. I'd rather take care of my own needs. How are we going to worship? Will we believe that Jesus is the king and act accordingly? Will we respond to that? Or parents, when... The scripture calls us to nurture our children in the Lord and not to provoke them to anger. Will we be able to do that? Will we bow before the king? And There are tons of other ways to think about that, but I hope those prompt you or provoke you to be thinking about the way you say, I believe Jesus is the king, and then look at how your behavior reflects that. Now, some of you may be here and, and you're not a believer. You, you're not a Christian. You don't buy this stuff. In fact, it all sounds crazy to you. And I understand how that could be the case. And so if you're not a follower of Christ and you're here, I want to say thank you for coming and being a part of this. Thank you for being willing to sit and listen to some guy talk about something that you don't necessarily believe. 
But I want you to know that I'm praying that God will help you to see that what's apparent on the surface of the crucifixion is not what's really going on. It is not a tragedy. It is a victory. And it is not a failure. It is an accomplishment. It is, it is the bringing together of all of the desires and purposes and plans of God. And I'm praying that you'll see it as your primary and only and singular hope to escape the penalty of your sin and that it is the one way you can be made right with God. Now before we leave this little section, I want you to, to pay attention to verses 26 and following when Jesus is there on the cross and try to wrap your mind around this for a moment, if you will. He's on the cross bearing the weight of the sin of the world and, and enduring the wrath of the Father and all of the things that are going on. Remember the, the picture that was painted in Psalm 22? His, his heart is like wax, it melts within him. His tongue is cleaving to the side of his mouth in thirst. He is, his bones have been pulled out of joint apparently because of the, the weight of, of his body against his shoulders and he is enduring ex, the exquisite physical but also spiritual agony of what's going on on the cross. And Jesus looks at his mother and he says, Woman, behold your son. And he looks at John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, and he says, Behold your mother. And he cares for her personally. And I think this is a declaration of the fact that Jesus is our king, not just corporately, but that he is your king and my king individually. That he is, he is expressing, John is reminding us of the personal relationship that we have entered into in Christ with God by the provision that he has made for us. And so as we're thinking on these things, we should be living in amazement and submission to the king. In fact, that brings me to the second thing that the cross work of Christ teaches us, and that is that it empowers our obedient response. In verses 28 to 30, the cross work of Jesus empowers our obedient response. I put the word empowers in your notes in the blank so that if you're taking notes, I want you to focus on that word so that you don't hear me saying the cross of Jesus is an example so you can work hard and earn something from him. No, the cross work of Christ empowers, enables you to respond to him in obedience. Not to earn something from him by obedience, but to respond to him in obedience. <clears throat> and we're going to have to, to um, think about some words in these verses for just a minute if we could. Notice in verse 28, Jesus knowing that all was now finished. And, and boy, I, I'm just thankful for Psalm 22. And again, the way that we've been moved towards thinking about this moment all morning. Then he says to fulfill the scripture. That the word fulfill comes from the same word group basically. It's the same word as finished. And then look down in verse 30. When Jesus received the sour wine he said it is finished. Same word again. Now I'd like for you to consider that as those words um, communicate to us we need to understand the, 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 the heart. I, uh, well we, get, we need to know the Greek okay. I'll just say it. I'm not very good at Greek. I'm not trying to impress you with something. But the words Jesus uses and the way they're written in the text, in the, in the Greek, tell us that he is accomplishing something that has an ongoing present result. So when Jesus says this work is finished, he's, he's talking about something that's been brought to completion, but it has ongoing consequences like right now. It produces results in your life and mine right now. That's what we're reading in the text. And so we <clears throat> respond to him in obedience because he has fulfilled or finished some things. In, in other words, he's brought glory to God in some particular ways. He has intentionally fulfilled the scriptures. Now, that's not all that Jesus is doing when John says, he said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. Jesus wasn't just technically like at the end of building a house going through a punch list. 
You know, when you, when you build a house, you have a punch list and you start going through because there are a thousand little details that need to be fixed. And sometimes you have to go, oh, the ceiling's leaking there. I need to go back so that you can go back and check everything off before it's finished. That's not what Jesus was doing. He tells us he thirsts because it is a fulfillment of Scripture. It is a reflection of the physical agony and all of the things that were going on there. <clears throat> And so you need to understand that, and that's a place for you to go back later and contemplate and meditate. But the point is that he is intentionally and perfectly fulfilling all of the things that God has given him to do. First of all, he glorifies God by the perfect obedience to the Father's will. And that's what he's communicating when he says, it is finished. In John chapter 17, verse 4, he used the same language again when he said, I glorified you on earth having accomplished or having finished the work you gave me to do. It was the guiding passion of Jesus to perfectly obey the will of God and therefore to give glory to God. And John wants us to see the perfections and the beauties of Christ's obedience and to believe that he is the one who has accomplished all these things towards God on our behalf so we can obey too. Jesus has accomplished all these things so we can obey too. And I want to give you a couple of points of application here in this little section. This addresses those of us who may have a certain sense of religious pride about us. And, and we tend to think about how we obey God and how others ought to. And, and you know, we have a good week and then we, we sort of look with disdain on those around us who are not doing all that they ought to be doing. And, and our religious pride wells up and, and we look around and say, you know what, you're not as faithful as I am and, and you're not doing as well as I am and, and I, I feel really good about my standing before God because of the things I've been doing. Let this text remind you that unless you have perfectly done it, unless you have completely obeyed every single command of Christ, you have no place for pride. Your hope is in the one who has done it. Okay? Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't try to obey. That's, no, Jesus died so you can obey. But don't take pride in your obedience. Give God glory for Christ's obedience. And, and this also speaks to those of you who are, are, are just of super tender heart. And you look at your efforts to obey and you don't do it so well. In fact, maybe even this morning, you've already had a fight with somebody or, a, or you've lashed out or you've sinned in some way. And you're going, man, I'm going to church and, and I didn't even get it right this morning. And, and you just live in a regular fear. Well, John's calling you to stop looking to your own obedience and look to the obedience that Jesus alone has supplied for your redemption. J.C. Ryle says, We rest on our souls on a finished work if we rest them on the work of Jesus. We need not fear that either sin or Satan or law shall condemn us at the last day. We may lean back on the thought that we have a Savior who has done all, paid all, accomplished all, performed all that is necessary for our salvation. I want to encourage you to be one who leans hard on Christ. As you're efforting to obey Him, remember the cry of the Apostle Paul when he said, Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. Another commentator said, when we look at our own works, we may well be ashamed of their imperfections. But when we look at the finished work of Christ, we may feel peace. We are complete in Him. Now, brother or sister, this is the heart of the Christian life. This is the place from which your obedience pours day to day and it's a place from which God is glorified in and through you. Secondly, Jesus glorifies God by revealing Him to us. I'm just going to quickly point these things out as we're pressing on. But Jesus, the cross is a reflection of the holiness of God. The cross is the only satisfactory remedy for sin because God is so holy. And so, gazing at the cross reminds us of how holy God is and it calls us to desire the same holiness. There's no other way to accomplish redemption than the cross 
because God is so holy. But it also communicates to us the love of God. So deep is the love of, the, of God for his people that he would go to those lengths to redeem us. And so it points out to us the holiness of God and expands it for us so that we can see how great it is and calls us to be holy too. And it also shows us the deep love that God has for you and calls you to respond to him in love as well. And so daily meditation on the cross work of Jesus will help you to see the character of God, to gaze on his beauty, and to respond accordingly. Let the cross be a place where the, the character and the beauty of God are revealed to you. And then thirdly, Jesus glorifies God by reflecting his sovereign power. The last line of verse 30, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. I'll remind you that in John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18, Jesus said, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I've received from my Father. Once again, try to wrap your head around the power of one who can decide, I'm going to die. Now. now, I'm not talking about taking your life or something like that. I'm talking about just deciding. Now it's time. I can't even decide to go to sleep when it's time. Sometimes I can't stay awake when it's time. And Jesus ruled over his own death. There was never a microsecond in this entire process where Jesus the King was not bringing glory to God by reflecting the character of God. And here he reflects it in his sovereign power. The one who raised people from the dead said, now it is time for me to die. And the language says that he gave over his spirit. It wasn't that he said, oh, now I can tell it's going to come. Any minute now, here it comes. And, and, then, and then he died. But he handed over or he delivered his spirit. And so we see the sovereign, glorious power of God. May the cross work of Christ empower you to respond to the beauties and the glories and the powerful nature of God with your own obedience. May, it, may you see... This is the one who lives in you. This is the one who has redeemed you from sin. This is the one who has said to you, you no longer have to follow your own flesh and the world. This is the one who is residing in you to work in you his own will and his purposes. Those are the things that empower and enable you. Not guilt and not you better be a better Christian and you better check these boxes and you better... No, no. It's gazing at the cross. And in fact, John Stott once said that his entire life and, and the, the positive nature of his ministry was due to residing in the shadow of the cross and staying close to it. Finally, the cross work of Jesus transforms our knowledge. So the cross work of Jesus informs our worship it, it applies and speaks to the daily choice of, of the king to whom we'll bow. It empowers and enables our obedient response. And then the cross work of Jesus transforms our knowledge. In verses 31 to 37, um, you'll notice that in verse 30, there, there's mention in verses 28 to 30 about fulfilling scripture. And we saw in Psalm 22 all these things. At the end in verse 36 and verse 37, John uses that language again. These things took place that Scripture might be fulfilled. And there he quotes from Psalm 34 and from um, Zechariah chapter 13 and from Numbers chapter 9 and from Exodus chapter 12. The, all these places of Scripture. And John is um, giving us evidence again to believe. Now, as an aside... I want to quickly say that John gives us all kinds of evidence that Jesus actually dies 
You know, there are some, and, and maybe some even in this room, who wonder if Jesus really died. I mean, if maybe he was, he was a, alive again later because he never really died. And lots of people have, have proposed that. And yet, I would suggest to you that when John says, he who saw it has borne witness, in verse 35, he, he's saying, I was there. I saw Roman executioners, those who were perfect at the process of execution, look at him and say, don't need to break his legs, he's already dead. And then, almost just as an, uh, an act of, of his callousness, this soldier thrusts up at Jesus with his sword and pierces into his side and blood and water flow forth as a, a further confirmation that Jesus was already dead. And so I would encourage you not to fall for the idea that Jesus only swooned or he passed out or, or he was temporarily unconscious. He was actually really dead. And then John appeals to these Old Testament uh, references and in doing so he's establishing a link between the Passover lamb and what's happening before their eyes on the cross. Or for the people who are reading this decades later or today in Auburn, Alabama, he's reminding us that all that was promised in the Passover lamb, all that was pictured in the Passover lamb is fulfilled in Jesus. Now remember that the Passover lamb was the lamb that was brought and it was required to be without blemish and in the preparation of the lamb for the Passover supper his bones could not be broken. And the lamb's blood had been originally spread on the doorposts and the lintel of the houses and because of that preparation the death angel passed over those homes and left living all those who were inside. And then later, the, the Passover supper was to commemorate God's deliverance of his people out of the bondage of Egypt, the, the cruel taskmaster and the slavery of their bondage there to Pharaoh. And so year after year after year, the Jewish people have been celebrating with, with hundreds and thousands of lambs. And even previous to the crucifixion, only by a few days the same celebration has taken place and the blood of the perfect unblemished lambs have been spilt and their bones have not been broken. And John is saying, look and see the culmination of all of the promises and all the redemptive purposes and all the signs and types and symbols. They have all been made obsolete because now the real thing is before your eyes. And the perfect spotless Lamb of God has been sacrificed and His blood has been poured out and none of His bones have been broken just as God commanded. And He has given His life once and all for the forgiveness of sins. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 18 says, Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. And so this culmination of all these things brings to a climax the very promises of God. And it calls us not only to know and understand intellectually what God has done, but to know and to experience the peace of God and the confidence before God that only relationship with Christ can provide. So I want to caution you this morning. If, if you're sitting back and saying, Listen, I, I know this. In fact, I probably know more about the atonement than you do, preacher. I, I can do the intellectual discussion about all the different aspects of the atonement. And that's good. You ought to do those things. But you need to understand that it will not matter a bit on the day of judgment what exalted view of the atonement you have. If you have not believed on the atoning sacrifice that is set before you. And if you have not by faith cast yourself and your soul upon Christ as your only hope for redemption, do you believe? Has your worship been informed? Are you finding yourself regularly from day to day to day choosing to worship the King and the King alone rather than yourself and your own desires and your own flesh? Has your uh, response been obedient? Have you been finding that those things which seemed impossible to you in the past are now becoming more your normal, natural response? 
And has your knowledge been transformed? Do you not just understand intellectually, but do you know that you belong to Christ because you have seen these evidences, because the Spirit of God has given you an assurance that you belong to Christ, because you have witnessed His powerful work in your own heart? Let me close by asking you this question. What's the difference between you? If you're a follower of Christ and you profess to follow Christ, what's the difference between you and a good moral non-believer? What's the difference between you and a good, upstanding, patriotic, moral, law-abiding citizen who makes no claim to follow Christ? Now, because I said in conclusion, let me encourage you not to start packing up yet, okay? Start packing up in your heart. This is what the difference ought to be between those of us who follow Christ and people around us who are basically good law-abiding moral people. The difference is what rules our hearts and what moves our obedience and what shapes our knowledge. Let's pray together. Father, as Christ has been set before us in this text as the great King and the only King, as the only one who empowers our obedience. But as the one who rightly deserves our obedience as our King. And as the one who transforms us in the way that we know you and, and think about you and respond to you and understand you. It's easy for us to sometimes look back 2,000 years and wonder how could those folks have been so, so dull of heart? How could they not have seen the connection? And yet sometimes we saying we believe what they missed live as practical unbelievers Sometimes there's very little difference in us and the moral people around us. And so I pray that you, by, by setting Christ before us today, would inform our worship and empower our obedience and transform the way that we understand and know you by the work of of Christ. We pray that you would do these things. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Let me ask if you would please to stand together with me again. and Let's sing what, what I call a hymn of amazement. Can it be that, that God has actually done these things? Can it be that He has actually redeemed us? And, and perhaps even in this singing response, um, God will help you to respond to Him.
give you this word of encouragement before we go. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Be encouraged by the gospel. And if you have questions concerning your own relationship to Christ or His church, I would love to talk with you about those things. And I'll be available. I'll just kind of be hanging around here at the front. We don't do a, a formal walk to the front um, thing. Um, because the entire sermon is an invitation to you to respond to Christ. But if you need help and want to talk with someone, we, we're not going to deny you that opportunity. Okay, so we want to talk with you. Please come and see me, and I'll be glad to do that. We'll gather again at 11.15, and we'll hear some reports from the summer ministry from uh, Caleb Petrie and Henry Yu. In the meantime, encourage one another in Christ. God bless you.